I do um, appreciate everybody coming today. Uh, like I said, this is really an unusual format for us. We typically like to host these events at the beautiful Langham Hotel in Pasadena where we can get to know people and, and have people share their stories and their experiences with us. But since we are in the middle of this very unusual time, um, it was still important for us to share what it is that we're doing in the division of colorectal surgery, learn a little bit more about digestive health. Um, and before I hand the discussion off to Dr. Lee, who you have come to see and, and probably not me, um, I want to introduce Katie McCorkle, uh, who is our Director of Development. Uh, many of you have probably already talked to her at some point. Uh, she's been a real key uh, team member on this group, just in terms of putting all of this together and, and welcoming people. And um, she has a very specific job about inspiration. And we'll, we will talk about a little bit of fundraising today. Uh, and at the end of the presentation, as I alluded to, you'll, you'll have a chance to learn about how to support the research and excellence in clinical activity. Uh, that makes us one of the top hospitals in the United States. So I want to first welcome Dr. Sang Lee. He's an expert on um, digestive health and his expertise is sought all over the world. We're so lucky to have him here. Um, He's going to introduce his team, share his presentation, and like I said, enjoy, ask questions, and we'll do our best to, to answer them. Dr. Lee? Thank you, Angie. The uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate this opportunity to be a little bit about our program uh, and to share with you some of the exciting things that we're working on in our division. So, um, you know, our program here at USC, colorectal surgery program, is one of the oldest academic colorectal surgery programs in the West Coast. And uh, we have eight full-time faculty members, which makes us one of the largest academic colorectal surgery programs in the country. Um, in addition to myself, Dr. Alt and Dr. Ortega are, are um, primarily at LA County, uh, but we have uh, five other surgeons that, that spend most of their time at the uh, private side, which is the Kett Hospital. So I'm gonna introduce uh, and have them in actually introduce themselves. Uh, first, Dr. Kyle Colon uh, is an associate professor and he's our program director. Dr. Colon, you wanna say some words about yourself and, and um, introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So um, it's maybe a little bit echoey. I just finished in the OR. Uh, so I'm from Southern California. I did my training um, in Chicago and then came back here and then joined the team. And I just want to acknowledge Dr. Lee's leadership because all of these things would not be possible with all the things that he's brought here. So hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Cologne. Next, we have Dr. Shea, um, is a assistant professor of um, surgery, and uh, she's been with us for three years already. Dr. Shea? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee and uh, Angie, for organizing this. Um, I came to Los Angeles for my fellowship training with Dr. Lee and the division here and stayed on fellowship, but I'm originally uh, from the Midwest and did all my training in New York City. So very happy to be a uh, West Coast person now with all the sunshine. Thank you. Next we have Dr. Philip Dodalow. Dr. Dodalow. Yep, thank you very much, Sang. Thank you, Angie, for setting this up. It's been an honor to be practicing with this particular group. But this is my fourth year at USC. Uh, but I did my, I actually grew up in Southern California, similar to Dr. Colon, uh, did my training at Loma Linda and then uh, more training at uh, New York um, and then came back here uh, to practice. And it's been definitely an honor and privilege to take care of the patients here in the Southern California area. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Shin. Dr. Shin um, trained with us while I was in New York in New York Presbyterian Hospital, and then he stayed as a faculty. And when I was asked to come 
um, to USC, I asked Dr. Shin to, to come and, and work with us here. Uh, she's been here with us for over five years. Dr. Shin? Dr. Shin? Are you muted? Are you muted? Yeah, sorry, I, I just unmuted. Hi, my name is Dr. Chung Ho Shin. I, I was born and grew up in Korea, but I did all my medical school and training in New York. Uh, where I uh, was a trainee at uh, Dr. Lee in 2011. Um, we have a, a group of expert uh, colorectal surgeons who uh, would uh, work together uh, to uh, you know, better our patients and, and provide the best care uh, for our patients in the, uh, in the Southern California. So I'm uh, happy to be here and we'll be uh, glad to answer any of your questions. Is Dr. Kohler? online with us yet or I don't see her. Dr. Kohler? Okay, so Dr. Kohler um, is from uh, Pennsylvania. She um, did surgery training at Temple University and, and did fellowship with us about a year ago and uh, she's really the newest addition to our faculty and she has done a really fabulous job of uh, caring for our patients. So you'll, you'll probably get a chance to meet, meet her uh, in the future. Oops. So our, our program is not complete without our um, surgery clinic staff. Uh, we have three. Um, Eva Moya has been with us for many, many years, even before I came here, even back in the days of Dr. Beard, I believe. Eva, you wanna introduce yourself? Hey everybody, I'm Eva. Um, yeah, I've been here for 10 years. Um, actually with not Dr. Beer, but Dr. Senegor, and it's just an honor to be working with these excellent team and it's just been great helping out all of you. And uh, many of you probably saw a G, uh, G Lee. She's uh, uh, the newest member uh, of the clinic staff, clinical staff. Um, she worked uh, at Good Sam Hospital for many years, and she joined us uh, to help mostly with the uh, inpatient as well as outpatient, and, and she's been actually um, really, really great help. G, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is G. Um, I joined the team a year ago, um, has been working with the, um, these excellent team on the inpatient side, uh, mostly. Um, so I work with attendings and residents at Keck um, and basically take care of a patient's um, post-operative dental discharge. And um, I work closely with our patient clinical staff with Debbie and Eva, which who have been incredible help. Um, so honored to be here with you. Thank you, G. Next we have Debbie. Um, Debbie actually has been my nurse for many, many years. She worked with me in New York for many years. And then when I got recruited here um, with Dr. Shin, she came with us, thankfully. And uh, she's been with us for, for over five years too. Debbie, you wanna say a few words? Yes, hello, I'm Debbie. Um, as Dr. Lee mentioned, I've been with him for about 12 years. Um, I also worked with Dr. Shin when he was in New York as well. Um, but I'm happy to be here, as Dr. Shea said, in sunny California. Thank you. So we, we always talk about academic colorectal surgery program, but what, what really is an academic colorectal surgery program? Um, it's really the trifecta of, of three things. One is the clinical excellence, because we're the tertiary um, care hospital. We get a lot of complex and very difficult cases. So we, we see a lot of rare cases. Um, because of that, you know, and because of our research, we have expertise to really take care of complex patients. But I think it's also important to, to, to emphasize that, you know, while we tr try to provide the best possible outcomes uh, for our patients, that, that we provide the care with real compassion, because a lot of our patients obviously are going through a very tough times in their lives. So 
to, to provide a very tender and, and very understanding, uh, compassionate care, I think it's very, very important. And as a training program, you know, we, we try to, to train the really next generation of leaders in our field. And we have medical students and residents, and then we have colorectal surgery fellows who are um, surgeons that have already finished general surgery training program but they choose to spend a year of a specialty training in colorectal surgery. So we, we train two colorectal surgery fellows a year. Um, and over the years, we trained over 50 colorectal surgery fellows. And, and the other, the third really import, important component of the academic surgery is, is research um, that, that involves um, the, the research clinical trials and developing new technologies and, and surgeons new techniques and, and um, provide innovative care uh, for the patient. So it, it really comes back full circle with the new technology and, and new innovation. We can apply that what we learn from research to, to uh, improve our patients' outcomes. And more than that, we, we share our knowledge with really rest of the country and rest of the, the um, uh, medical world to really improve everybody's outcomes. So I want to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the inno um, innovative researches that, that we're working on. So clinical excellence, what separates us from other programs, we do most of our uh, colorectal cases min using minimally invasive techniques. Um, this means laparoscopy, also robotics, and the luminal surgery, which we'll, I'll get into a little bit later. And also, we see a lot of patients that come to us for second opinion, patients with rectal cancers who are told that they need to have a permanent colostomy. So patients who, who come to us, even though they were told they need to have a permanent colostomy, um, it's often possible uh, for us to provide um, procedures and, and techniques that, that allow us to, to avoid uh, performing permanent colostomy uh, for our patients. And then also we also see a lot of patients who present to us with the very complex polyps that gastroenterologists tell us that they need to have a part of their colon removed, but we have um, new techniques that we developed and, and we're also working with other um, industry um, companies and, and leaders to, to develop a new technique and, and new platforms to be able to do this without removing any part of the intestines. And uh, with all of these, we'll, we'll you know, provide less morbid procedures with compassion. And we've been, um, fortunately, we've been recognized um, by others. We, we ranked, as you heard, uh, 15, uh, 15th na nationwide for GI and, and GI surgery. Um, we're um, particularly proud uh, because our overall GI surgery and, and uh, medical GI program is relatively small compared to other programs that are on uh, top 20. Um, and we also have, we're recognized for our colorectal cancer surgery care as high performing on colon, uh, colon cancer surgery scorecard by US News and World Report. And one of the things that I think really that led us to this recognition is we have a lot of innovative um, quality improvement programs. Dr. Cologne and others uh, have uh, um, really tried to, to come up and help implement a lot of these programs. One, one is an enhanced recovery after surgery program that allow us to have a much better outcomes in patients who have colorectal surgery. Um, another one is surgical site infection prevention program to, to decrease the surgical site infection after colon surgery. And then other programs to decrease length of stay after surgery and then to de decrease dehydration from high stoma output uh, after il temporary ileostomy and colostomy uh, procedures. 
So enhanced recovery after or surgery or ERAS program, um, it's really a combination of a lot of different things to, to decrease uh, morbidity and, and faster recovery after colorectal surgery. So it's a combination of pre-op nutrition, uh, avoid fasting, giving carbohydrates, early feeding, early ambulation, and minimizing narcotics to, again, really enhance uh, recovery process and, and, um, and, and also early discharge safely. And our efforts to decrease surgical site infection really resulted in really very, very low surgical site infection related to colorectal surgery. So compared to national average 8%, our, our surgical site infection in our division is 2.4%, which is very, very low. So we're very proud of our efforts to decrease um, and, and improve um, outcome. And we're also proud to tell you that over the last five years, our volume um, of, of patients encounters and also surgery has essentially doubled. Um, that's why also you see a significant growth in number of faculties and we hope to continue uh, our efforts to grow and have a, a presence um, in, in Southern California and, and beyond. Now the other important part is the colorectal surgery education. Dr. Colon, do you want to mention something? about the our, uh, colorectal surgery education. He's our program director for colorectal surgery fellowship training program. Yes, yeah. so we have two trainees a year going back 26 years. So we have actually have close to 70 surgeons that we've trained. Uh, and every year I'm always impressed. We seem to get the applicants that are the best and the brightest. So we're really looking forward to the future. Great, thank you. So, I mean, the teaching also goes beyond um, our residents and fellows. You know, we have an annual symposium where surgeons from all over the country that, that come to us and uh, we have an update on colorectal surgery. So it, it's a very well attended um, symposium that we started about uh, four or five years ago. And, and uh, we also try to share our expertise with, with others. Um, you know, we're very active. We have many textbooks that we have edited together, uh, many articles and uh, a lot of presentations. So we have national presence um, in terms of our expertise and our training and, and, uh, and knowledge. Um, now I wanna just talk briefly about research here at uh, USC um, and in our division. Um, I think one of the really most exciting research that, that we've been working on. Um, so if you look at the incidence of colorectal cancer over the last um, 30 or 40 years, because of screening colonoscopy, we saw a significant decrease in incidence of colorectal cancer. But when we looked at the the, the rate of colon, ca colon cancer, colon surgery, um, even though rate of colon cancer is decreasing, the, the rate of colon cancer surgery or co colectomy in this country really remain the same. So that sort of raises a question, why are we still performing all these colon surgeries when the, the rate of cancer is decreasing and in fact, the indication for surgery for other, other um, indications like diverticulitis also has been decreasing. So it's been um, hypothesized that, that that continued rate of colon surgery is probably for benign colon polyps. So the question is then, is that really the, the removing somebody's colon for benign colon polyps? Is that the best that we can offer our, our patients? So as we're thinking about this um, a while back, we came up with a um, different, um, different technique to really preserve patient's colon without having to, to do a colon resection. So we had an idea to combine laparoscopy and colonoscopy to remove these very difficult polyps that gastroenterologists feel that they cannot remove it with a uh, conventional colonoscopy. 
So the idea is that if, if you have a very large flat polyp in a very tough location, then you can use a laparoscopic tool to facilitate removal uh, of these polyps using endoscopic colonoscopic tools. And then we can also, if, if he happened to damage the colon wall in the process, we can immediately recognize it and then laparoscopically repair that area, all to prevent removal of the colon, any part of the really intestines or the colon. So when we looked at our data, um, we, we saw that there's a significant improvement on patient outcomes. After laparoscopic colectomy, patients stay in the hospital for two to five days, and it usually takes them you know, almost a month to recover and, and return to work. Instead, with the experience now, these patients go home on the same day, and they return to work in days as opposed to weeks. So it's a, it's a significant, significant improvement. And, and we're one of the few centers in this country to really do this. And we're one of the first, first surgeons to really offer these type of um, technique. And also when we looked at the, the cost associated with it, when we did this combined uh, endoscopic laparoscopic surgery, compared to laparoscopic um, colectomy patients, we saved about $7,500 per patient. And for open colectomy, which 50% of the um, uh, patients in this, in this country still undergo open colectomy for these type of indications, we can save up to 15,000, almost $15,000 per patient. So even though in this country, the rate of colon cancer is decreasing all over the world, it, the, the colorectal cancer is really fastest rising um, cancers. And obviously the cost related to that is, is uh, tremendous. So it has a really far reaching implications for patients and, and also the, the cost associated with this type of uh, pathology um, all over the world. So to beyond what we're doing now, we've been working with many companies like uh, Olympus, uh, Boston Scientific, um, the Lumendi to, to develop the next, next really generation of uh, platforms and instruments to do this from totally inside of the colon. So we have flexible robots now. These are not the robots that you hear of today where they're putting the robots in through the, through the abdomen and taking somebody's colon out. So these are flexible robots that you can insert into the colon and you're essentially doing a full um, laparoscopic-like surgery from inside of the colon to take care of these very complex um, colorectal conditions. So this is what we're working on, and um, there's some of these platforms will be available now, and then also it's going to be available, really, the next wave will be available over the next few years. And I think this will really revolutionize the way we do our surgeries, and hopefully um, I often think about this, you know, when my great grandkids were talking about me, my great grandfather used to be a surgeon. He used to open people up and cut out somebody's colon. They'll probably, you know, think that I was a really barbaric for doing something like that. And I think this will completely change the way we treat our patients in the future. And because of our expertise in this area and, and uh, research, we, we um, invite um, colorectal surgery trainees, fellows from all over the country, from the US and Canada, and they spend um, twice a year, um, they spend two days with us learning about the, the new technology, new platforms, and, and, uh, and uh, we've trained over 200 colorectal fellows uh, over the last four, four years. So, Again, it's an exciting program that we have, and we use our uh, simulation facility here, um, tissue lab facility to do this, and it's been very, very helpful and, and training next generation of uh, leaders uh, in endoluminal surgery. So I, I would like to conclude my presentation um, by uh, going over our mission statement, uh, our 
mission is to, to uh, provide compassion and, and, and innovative patient care for all aspects of colon and rectal disease. And our mission is to provide the best patient care possible by focusing on patient outcomes, satisfaction, individual support, and cultural sensitivity. So I'd like to thank you once again for joining us. Um, and uh, I'd like to turn it over to Angie. Thank you. Stay on this slide here for a second because I actually want to, I appreciate that. I, I actually, I had a couple of questions. We had some come in and I had some plan that I wanted to, to ask, but I wanna make this statement first that what you and your team do is absolutely incredible. I think it's something that people don't really understand in the way that, you know, in this is relative, I, I promise. In kindergarten, I wrote a little essay and I got to go to the capital of Washington state and like meet writers. And I, I, I thought that was like the biggest deal in the world. And here you are, talking about editing textbooks that I don't know how many people actually get to read and are part of and going through this whole presentation like, oh, look it, it's just something we do. We just do this every day, it's no big deal. So I just wanna bring that around to everybody in the audience and say, this is the work that I see this team doing is absolutely phenomenal in every way. Um, so that, that is just, my hats are off to you guys because this is, it's special, it's incredible. It's not something that you can see necessarily in the community all the time. And, and I hope that there's a question that, um, that comes up about community. Um, it's, it's really, really special. So that it goes to my, now you can go to the next slide because I wanna talk briefly um, Believe me, the Q&A is, is even more important than this, but I think it, it goes without saying that being able to support, for us to support people like you and the surgeons, which is really supporting all of our community and our healthcare world, right? Um, Fundraising is about two things. It's people and hope. And we, we have both of those things in spades um, here. It, the impact of healthcare fundraising, it really allows Dr. Lee and his team to do all the things that, that they're able to do, to learn the next thing and to train surgeons that may not be in Los Angeles, that may end up in small town USA and helping somebody the way that maybe he's helped one of you or one of your family members. So anytime that we get any sort of funding from a, um, a private sector, because the NIH funding is, is certainly decreasing these days, it helps to improve that clinical excellence. It helps to train those next generation. It, you can't do this stuff for free. And with the impact of COVID, you know, we've had to stop doing a few things here and uh, from a research perspective. And, and for a while, they even halted all surgeries. So there's a, there's a reality to where we're at. And the only thing that shortens the distance between, you know, I saw a question earlier is how long will it take until we don't have to cut anybody for surgery. And the equation to that is it's all about time and money. Sometimes the more money that you have shortens the amount of time that you can get someplace because you can have additional resources, additional um, equipment and data analysis and things like that. So I wanna put this out here and now we'll go to Q&A because that's the most important part. But I did wanna share that all of the things that Dr. Lee is doing are, um, they're, they're, they are beyond excellent. And um, I really am, I'm honored to be a part of this and this particular group here and to see that, that philanthropy is, is meaningful. So my last thing here is that if you, there will be a slide if you are interested in, in learning more about how to give or talking to your family and friends about what it is we do here being able to tell your story, um, that's really important for us too. But again, this is Dr. Lee's show. And, and I, I, always, <laughs> I always butt in at the end and say, but wait, but wait, because these guys are so humble and um, giving them the ability to take it to that next level is, is what I 
you know, hope to inspire with this particular group. So question and A, Q and A. Katie, you have a couple of questions that came through while we were talking. Thank you, Angie. Yes, I do. Okay, so the first question is, what percentage of colorectal surgery is for cancer? Yeah, I want to introduce Dr. Kohler. She joined us a little bit later, but, but I introduced you uh, before. But she's uh, one of our late, latest additions to our faculty. Dr. Kohler, you want to introduce yourself and answer that question? Hi, I'm Sarah Kohler. I'm one of the newest faculty uh, members at USC in the field of colorectal. Um, I just joined um, about a year ago, so I'm happy to be here. I did my training with the department as well. Um, as far as the exact number or percentage wise of colorectal surgery that's performed for cancer, I'm not sure of the exact percentage. I think it depends a little bit on the institution. So some centers focus more on cancer or some focus more on inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so it kind of depends a little bit on the, the institution, but um, I would say as far as for colon resections and how many colons we remove for cancer, maybe around 50% is my guess, but I'm not totally sure. Okay, our next question. How do you solve a hernia that's causing problems and you can't have surgery? Yeah, it can be a, a tough problem. Um, we work a lot with uh, at one of our team members who's not here today, but is a enterostomal therapist. And so uh, there are a lot of non-operative tricks that you can do to minimize the impact of a, a hernia, particularly if it's near a stoma. So those two members are uh, critical to taking care of the patients. Thank you. Uh, besides chemotherapy with radiation, is there some medicine to stop the growth of cancerous cells? Yeah, I mean, um, the chemotherapy is uh, these days uh, uh, categorized into two categories. One is a cytotoxic, it's more conventional chemotherapy. And the second is a more targeted a therapy, usually in the form of antibody or small molecules. These days there are uh, what is called immunotherapy, uh, which targets a specific receptor in the tumor cells. Uh, and those, um, there are newer therapies has a less side effects and uh, they are more specific and it works very well for a, a certain type of a colon cancer. Thank you. That's, that's great. Um, the next one is ties in how amount, how, what amount uh, uh, or how many times of radiation and chemotherapy can the human body withstand before a surgery? So uh, radiation's you know, part of the sort of local therapy for patients that we give for mainly rectal cancers, but there is a limit. And, you know, this has actually been, you know, well sort of established, especially, you know, we utilize uh, radiation for a lot of cancers that do occur within the pelvis, such as prostate, as well as uh, cervical or uterine cancer and such. But yes, there is a limit. And, you know, typically we also work with the radiation oncologist in regards to how we manage patients, especially for rectal cancer, uh, with radiation. But nowadays, we actually have newer strategies for radiation. We basically have uh, beam modification therapy where they target specific areas and the specific dose varies uh, so that it minimizes damage to neighboring structures, uh, but also different courses of radiation, including long course versus short course. And uh, either of those may be appropriate for uh, certain patients uh, when they present to us with rectal cancer and the types of uh, ways that uh, you know rectal cancer can present, whether it's invading other structures or whether it's localized to the rectum. Thank you so much. Um, there is also a comment um, that uh, there was surgery that was done with Dr. Lee and Dr. Van Dam, and they were really surprised at how quickly they recovered. There was a lot less pain and discomfort than they imagined, and so so much needless worry over this procedure. Dr. Lee, do you want to comment on that comment? Yeah, so Dr. Van Dam, so we, we work together as a team. So Dr. Van Dam is a gastroenterologist, is an interventional gastroenterologist. So if somebody um, gets sent to him for a very complex colon benign polyp, um, we work together to, to take care of those um, problems using um, colonoscopy, laparoscopy. Sometimes we, we can use a and the luminal platform, as we talked about, 
together to, to take care of this problem to avoid um, removing um, part of the colon. So if we can successfully do that, um, much less invasive, much faster recovery, and really doesn't have any significant impact on the function um, and, and much less um, chance for uh, potential complication. So we, we probably have one of the largest experience uh, in the world for, for doing these type of procedures. So we've already you know, become a destination program for somebody with this issue. So we, we often have patients from uh, different parts of the country that will come to us to, to get these type of problem taken care of at USC. We looked at our outcomes and Dr. Lee mentioned there's a lot of surgery for benign polyps. So of the outside scopes that got done that sent to us that were quote unquote unresectable benign polyps, 70% of those we took out with endoscopic means. Are, when is it okay to have non-life-threatening elective surgery? I think during this period of COVID, I think there is a lot of hesitation coming to campus. Is there someone that could, I don't know, maybe even one of the PAs, you know, what, what Keck is doing to, to make it safe for patients to come? Um, so at Keck, we have a lot of safety measures. We're um, taking temperatures. Everyone's required to wear a mask. Um, social distancing. We don't have very many people in the lobby. We limit the amount of people that can come in um, with patients so that we have less people coming in um, and less exposure. Um, and we do a lot of COVID testing prior to um, any procedures that might aerosolize um, the virus. So we test patients three days before any procedure. Um, I think that's it. So are you performing um, these surgeries, Dr. Lee and the rest of the team? We are. I, we never stopped, really. Um, and also, you know, we're kind of unique in that we don't, have a, we don't have an emergency room where anybody can just walk in off the street. So we were relatively spared from having COVID uh, affecting our institution. So I think it probably at its worst, we had 11 patients in house with COVID and, and mostly in the ICU. Um, so we, everybody gets tested, everybody use a uh, protective gear. Uh, so our rate's very, very, very low overall in the hospital. Um, so it's very safe to have an elective surgery. So we really never stopped. And in fact, um, for the first two months um, of, of this year, which our academic calendar starts in July, um, the number of cases we performed in our division compared to the same time last year is significantly higher. So even though there's COVID going on, we, we have been performing elective urgent cases all along. So um, it, it is very safe to have it done right now. Katie, I'm sorry. I actually picked up a question here while you guys were all talking and, and hopefully it was, it was based on my last slide. What is it that keeps all of you up at night? What's the one thing that you wish you had so you could go to that next level? Dr. Shea, I'm going to start with you. Uh, well, I guess the thing that I wish I had more of was time um, in order to get all the projects done that we have on our plate. I think a lot of the uh, work that we do requires a lot of collaboration amongst our faculty members, our research um, fellows, and even the residents. And part of that is just not only generating the ideas that we have floating around based on our hospital care um, and the care of our patients, but really trying to put them together into questions that we can try to answer in a very systematic way that can make an impact on healthcare in general. So um, that takes a lot of time and brain power, and it's not something that we can do alone. So if there's one thing I would ask for, it'd be that. And one uh, question came in, if you have a regular colonoscopy done, do you have to be COVID tested prior to the procedure? Yes, <clears throat> yes we do, because you can potentially aerosolize the virus. So we, we, we um, test for COVID before any, any procedures. Okay, and what determines when surgery is needed for benign polyps in the rectum? 
so it's a relative uh, expertise, really. So if you have a benign polyp in the rectum, um, it's a little bit more excessive, uh, more accessible than than you know really large complex polyps that are further in in the colon. So there are many many different techniques that we can use to remove it. But if there's a if you find that there's a focus of cancer there, then that's completely changed the situation. But as long as we, we know that it's a benign, if the pathology shows that it's benign, we have a lot more options. So I'm gonna go back to Angie's question. So, you know, there, there are a lot of surgeon scientists that, that do uh, basic science research, and I think that's, that's great. But um, my feeling is that as surgeons, we'll probably make uh, more significant impact on our patients that we treat if you do really technology, uh, technique-based research and, and or outcomes research. So and that's what we do here. But unfortunately, for compared to basic science research where you, there are a lot of many opportunities for support, it's a little bit more difficult to get funding and, and support for those type of um, research. And so far, we have been very successful in doing that uh, through collaboration with a different industry and with the support from, you know, donations and, and so forth. But um, it's becoming more and more difficult. I know it's a very challenging time for everybody, but I think all of us, have, you know, have to be more resourceful to, to make these things work. But, I mean, I think it's certainly is a very important thing that, that we really need, need to continue to focus in on and, and make efforts to, to uh, further um, technology to improve our patients' outcomes. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate this whole group coming together and sharing their areas of expertise with all of us today. We are, we're, we're running out of time and I'm sure everybody has more Zoom calls to do today. Um, that may be exciting or not so exciting, depending on who you, who you are. But this particular group, if you want to make an appointment with one of our physicians, or you're interested in learning more about how to make a gift, um, I believe there's a slide that we can put up for that. Um, and we'll point you in the right direction. But in the meantime, you will hear from all of us again via an email. Um, we will send out the recording so you can share that with, with people um, that you'd like to. And that's, those are my, um, here we go. Those are my, those are my parting words. Really, again, write these numbers down. The appointment you can make directly with the office. Um, this entire group of surgeons and, and the whole team, they are very personable and compassionate and it's just, it's such a great group of people to have as I'm sure you all, as I'm sure you all know. So we appreciate you being here today and um, we can sign off. Thank you team, very, very much. Thank you so much for joining us today, thank you.